Let's keep reading, shall we? Part 6. Uh, I'll begin with a um, block quote from Yeats. Um, well, the first sentence before the block quote. Only those who have never tried can think that Yeats's attempt to catch sight of the visions as they fly was easy. Nor should those who have not practiced such attention be quick to dismiss. Yeats's sus suspicion that such presences have a real outward effect. Now beginning the block quote. G said that he has thought, he has always thought that the bad luck of Ireland comes from hatred being the foundation of our politics. It is possible that emotion is an evocation and in ways beyond the senses alters events, creating good and evil luck. Certainly evocation with symbol has taught me that much that we think limited to certain obvious effects influences the whole being. A meditation on sunlight, for instance, affects the nature throughout, <clears throat> producing all the effects which follow from the symbolical nature of the sun. Hatred must, in the same way, create sterility producing many effects which would follow from meditation on a symbol. Such a symbol would produce not merely hate, but associated effects. An emotion produces a symbol. Sensual emotion dreams of water, for instance, just as a symbol produces emotion. Part 3 The world of our experience is full of moods passions, half-glimpsed visions, apparitions, absent-minded absorptions in memory or fable. It may be that the materialist is right to say that all these airy nothings can affect reality only through the acts that we perform under the influence. That they are misperceptions which the truly adequate intelligence would never allow. Since none of us are such adequate intelligences, and since the materialist may also be mistaken, we can perhaps agree to learn a little of those moods and phantoms without committing ourselves to any definite belief in their mind-independent reality. Perhaps Yeats was right, because those imaginary people are created out of the deepest instinct of man, to be his measure and his norm. Whatever I can imagine those mouths speaking must be the nearest I can go to truth. That was all Yeats. Yeats's literary and hermetic friends, and mystagogues since then, believed that fairies were indeed the ancient gods, that mystical paganism was a religious option. Believing in fairies was believing that the divine interpenetrated all the natural world. That oak and nightingale and river took their life and being from the unseen world. More fiercely than the conventional Christianity of their day, though not of all days, the neo-pagans insisted that it was through an awakening of passionate enthusiasm that, that the divine was known, that beauty and violence were not distractions from the proper way. Block quote from Yeats. Can there be anything so important as to cry out that what we call romance, poetry, intellectual beauty, is the only signal that the supreme enchanter, or someone in his counsels, is speaking of what has been and shall be again in the consummation of time. End block quote. It was also to believe that the divine was best understood, for now, in its complexity. In the end, or the beginning, there was only the one. But mortals could not encompass that without unconsciously representing it as narrow and one-sided. We had better acknowledge the manifold complexity of the divine, 
that it was not for us to try and unify love and justice, pity and righteous anger in our minds. We should acknowledge that there are many ideals and goals in life that we cannot unite, and should instead be glad that different gods have different votaries. Yeats imagined that a new age was being born. Quote, from all that our age had rejected, from all that his stories symbolize as a harlot and would take after its mother. Because we had worshipped a single God, it would worship many or receive from Joachim de Flora's Holy Spirit, Joachim de Flora's Holy Spirit, a multitudinous influx. End blah, quote. This moral outlook, of course, is very close to that of mainstream moral philosophy. Polytheism is, in part, the belief in the existence of many incommensurable values and ideals. Mainstream philosophers, being respectable people, have been less ready to welcome Yeats's rough beast of laughing, ecstatic destruction. We have also had longer to observe what such fantasies are like in practice. According to Yeats, quote, two conceptions, that of reality as a congeries of beings, that of reality as a single being, alternate in our emotion and history. The, quote, sweet everlasting voices of the city are a constant temptation a constant tug away from single-mindedness, a reminder that all human goods have their price. But though for some the fairies are gods, the divine in its multiplicity, that is not entirely how they appear in common lore. Perhaps 20th century mystagogues are right to think that they are displaced or half-forgotten gods. Perhaps suspicious Christians were wrong to think them devils. But fairy lore, when it is not interpreted by hermeticists, makes fairies more marginal and more sinister than any real epiphanies of God should be. Yeats himself recognizes that those who are carried off by fairies are lost to ordinary duty, lost to the human world, for us, they are images of the irresponsible. They refuse to grow up and deal with the agonized complexities of human life. Yeats tries to say what reality the belief in changelings intimidated or um, intimated, connecting it obscurely with the notion that in ordinary life, we are asleep. What hermetic interpretation Yeats intended I do not understand, but he was perhaps seeking a subjective alternative to the obvious, objective meaning. Changelings are detected from outside by their obvious deformity, their failure to grow or prosper. They are what we would call idiots, imbeciles, diseased or deformed children. Quote, a winicky child, one which was weak, frail and peevish, was of the nature of a changeling." End quote from Evans Wentz. They are detected in our own past history, subjectively, by our metaphorical absence. So Rain describes her past, quote, People claim to have met, or even to have known us at such a time and in such a place, but we know that we were never in that place or only as a traveler passing through on our way to those times and places where life awaits us. The person the world may have seen, seen has been rather a cloak of invisibility than my real presence. I have reserved the right to be absent in spirit, and to absent I have been more often than not, on precisely those occasions when I have been met or seen.